Hello again, Bio 220 students. This is going to cover chapter three of our first lesson module. Well, essentially observing microorganisms through a microscope, which is a tool to help us observe things that are on a scale that we can't normally see. Let's see. Uh, okay, well, typically when we're looking at disease-causing agents, or really just microorganisms in particular, we're going to be looking at two scales, which are micrometers represented by mu m, which mu looks like a Greek version of u, and also nanometers represented nm. And well, what this slide is trying to tell you is that there's essentially 10 to the negative 6 one micrometer is essentially 10 to the negative 6 meters, or 10 to the negative 3rd millimeters. Or basically, one micrometer is 1.001 .001 millimeters. And then a nanometer is just 10 to the negative 9th meters. Well, another way of looking at it is, since you're going to be using nanometers and micrometers, between different microorganisms. 1,000 nanometers is the same as one micrometer. So where we talk about micrometers for bacteria or cellular organisms, nanometers are for typically viruses. So if 1,000 nanometers is one micrometer or 0 0.001 micrometers is one nanometer, Essentially, what you'll what you just need to interpret is that nanometers are very small, micrometers are small, but nanometers are much smaller. All right, two terms: total magnification and resolution. Well, essentially, we're going to skip into the. types of microscopy. Well, any kind of microscope that uses visible light to observe specimens is going to be involved in light microscopy. Types of light microscopy. Well, these could be compound light microscopy, dark field, phase contrast, and many more. Compound light microscopy is unique or specific in that, it needs contrast agents, or dyes, to help distinguish different parts of what you're looking at. And well, let's just go back to those two terms, which was total magnification and resolution. Resolution is really how, on what level can you clearly distinguish a unit of length? Is a, is a certain microscope only able to see a resolution on a micrometer scale, like four micrometers long? Or is it only, or is it able to even go as far as, say, hundreds of nanometers in length? Essentially, resolution is how, how clear of an image can you see and how, how, how small can you get a clear image? Total magnification involves two things. It involves, firstly, the ocular lens. The ocular lens is essentially the eyepiece that you initially look at when you're looking through a microscope. And essentially, this typically magnifies whatever reaches the ocular lens, typically by 10. Now, what is going to be hovering across where you actually have your sample that you're observing, either a skin cell or some microorganism, are gonna be your objective lenses, which you can rotate to get different levels of objective magnification. Your objective lenses can range in many, many sizes. Oftentimes they could easily range from either 0.4 magnification, 10 times magnification, 40 times and 100 times. And total magnification is going to be the product 
of whatever your objective lens is multiplied by the magnification of your ocular lens. So as an example, let's just say your, object, your ocular lens, it always has a 10 times magnification. So if you have your objective lens set at 0.4 magnification, or I should say at 40 magnification, it will magnify that specimen's image 40 times. And by the time that image reaches your eyepiece, the ocular lens, it will times that even more by 10. So in that particular setup with a 40x objective lens and a 10x ocular lens, what you're actually seeing or observing with your eyes is 40 times the original size. Now let's say a different setup. Let's just say the ocular lens is still 10x because that usually does not get switched out, but you switch or rotate your objective lens to 100 times magnification. So the objective lens times the ocular lens in that particular setup would magnify your image, your original specimen image by a thousand times. And well, that's essentially how total magnification works. Now in a compound microscope, the image from the objective lens is magnified again by the ocular lens. That's something that we just covered. Whatever the objective lens is, 40x, 10x magnification, multiplied by the eyepiece, the ocular lens, which is typically 10x, that total magnification, well, it's called total magnification. And this just details how light travels from underneath your specimen through a light source, and then eventually gets reflected in many ways to help magnify it, eventually reaching the eyepiece and into your vision. When you're using a compound light microscope, you should try to position the eyepieces, the ocular lenses, so that your eyes are looking into, so that each eye is looking into an ocular lens, instead of only looking into just one with one eye. This is to help prevent uh, damage. The other term, which in addition to total magnification is resolution. Remember this term. It is the ability of the lens to distinguish two points of length. So a microscope that has a resolving power of 0.4 nanometers, it can distinguish something that has that is at least 0.4 nanometers in length. Things that involve shorter wavelengths of light, or in our words, higher, higher energy of light, provide greater, magnif greater resolution. Shorter wavelength or higher energy of light, it does have the side effect of you can go too short of a wavelength, or in other words, too high of an energy, where you actually damage what you're observing. So, essentially, the shorter the wavelength, the better the resolution because you're using a higher energy type of light, but there is a limit. Refractive index is simply a measure of light bending the ability of whatever medium your substance is in, water, oil, whatever your specimen is located in. Now, immersion oil it's, uh, it's used to keep light from refracting. Basically, if you're using an immersion oil microscope, immersion oil helps give you a crisp, clear image. And if you do not use that oil, well, then your image will probably be very fuzzy and have a much lower resolution. It'll be less clear. And well, this is just how immersion oil helps direct certain directions of light or unrefracted light into your eyepiece for magnification. Whereas those bits of light that are refracted, they don't get in, they don't interfere with what you're actually observing. Or I should say, if you did not have oil, you would have more light being refracted away, causing a fun, a fuzzier image or a less clear, a less resolved image.
bright field illumination. Well, essentially dark objects are visible against a bright background and light reflected off of the specimen does not actually enter the objective lens. Yeah. This is just showing how bright field, bright field microscopy has its own way of redirecting light to eventually reach your eyepiece. So the instruments of microscopy, well, dark field microscopy, essentially it lights up objects or I should say light, lighter objects are visible against a very dark background. And while opaque involves an opaque disc placed in a condenser, and only light that reflected off of the specimen enters the objective lens. Well, these next few slides are really just gonna get into really definitions of different types of microscopy. And essentially how each one is very unique. Take into account phase contrast microscopy, which allows the examination of living organisms and also internal cell structures. So essentially getting into cellular organisms and also parts of the cell. It brings together two sets of light, rays, which are direct rays, and diffracted rays to form, well, a combined image. And essentially what is being shown on the right is how different light is being eventually combined, both direct light and refracted light. Now differential interference contrast or DIC microscopy, it's similar to phase contrast. Now what this does though is it uses two light beams and a prism to split the light beams, which helps give more contrast and color to the specimen you're looking at. Case in point. Now fluorescence microscopy. This involves using photons of light, usually in the UV or the short wavelength, AKA very high energy level of light. What happens is that fluorescent substances or substances that can absorb UV light will absorb that high energy UV light and then emit it at a lower energy or essentially short wavelength light gets absorbed, it loses energy, and then what gets released is, high, is longer wavelength of light or lower energy light that is no longer in the UV region of light, but in the visible region of light. Essentially, what we can actually interpret as colors. Cells may be stained with fluorescent dyes, which are called fluorochromes, if they do not naturally fluoresce. Essentially, fluorochromes, fluorescent dyes, they'll stain cells to help distinguish different parts of a cell if it doesn't naturally Observe, absorb UV light and emit colored light. So confocal microscopy. Well, in this situation, cells are stained with fluorescent dyes to assist in the contrast or, the, or insist in interpreting those uh, cells, different structures of those cells. It uses high energy light which is from the shorter wavelength region of light or blue light to excite a single plane or region of a specimen. And then each plane of that specimen is illuminated. And then those planes are compiled to get a three dimensional image, usually or with the aid of a computer. And in this case, we're observing the nucleus of a cell. Now, two-photon microscopy, it goes one step further. Essentially, cells are initially stained with some fluorescent dye, and then a photon of light is shot 
toward that substance. And then a second photon of light is shot to further increase that wavelength of light. Well, essentially, two photons of long wavelength or low energy red light are used to excite dyes. And it can help study cells that are upwards of one millimeter deep. Now, just an example of TPM, two photon microscopy, gives a very beautiful image. Scanning acoustic microscopy, well, that just simply involves sound waves, which bounce off of a specimen. And well, these essentially help us to look at surfaces of a cell and they give a, re a resolution around one micrometer. So again, using scanning or sound waves, it really is good at, use, at interpreting the surface of a cell. So different microscopies give different levels of uh, penetration or how deep you can observe a cell, either on the surface or even to the internal organelles. The clearest type of microscopy is electron microscopy, which actually uses electrons instead of photons of light. The shorter wavelength of electrons, or the higher energy, gives greater resolution. Essentially, if you want the greatest resolution or the most clearest image of a very, very small structure, you're going to need to go to electron microscopy. And well, it's used for images that are too small for even light microscopes, such as viruses. Well, transmission electron microscopy. It's another type of microscopy. Essentially, a beam of electrons passes through an ultra-thin cross-section of a specimen. And then through an electromagnetic lens, which helps interpret the beam of electrons. Specimens may be stained with heavy metal salts for contrast. So essentially with these electron microscopes, what you're seeing now is not actually the beam of light, but actually the beam of electrons being shot and dispersed through a sample. Whereas many light microscopes might be able to reach maybe 1,000 times magnification, for electron microscopy, it's actually pretty standard to reach much higher levels, 10 times or even 100,000 times magnification. And in this case, we're able to see on the order of picometers. Essentially, one picometer is 10 to the negative 15th meters, so it's a very very small section of a meter. Scanning electron microscopes involve an electron gun that produces a beam of electrons that will scan the surface of an entire specimen. Secondary electrons emitted from the specimen are then used to produce a three-dimensional image that can then be observed. And well, this is just continuing a discussion of how beams of electron are shot into a sample and then secondary electrons are shot out of the specimen into what is interpreted by electron collector, collectors and receptors. Again, gets into very good resolution, easily into the nanometer scale. Well, for the remainder of these slides, they're really getting into just the different types of microscopy. And well, it is good to get into an earnest, it is good to briefly read into each of these different types. But to be honest, just know that different ones are specific to different levels of resolution.
eh, essentially what a light, a compound light microscope can do, an electron microscope can see even, even further. Even going to one one hundredth of that of an atom. Truly, truly amazing stuff. Hmm. All right. Again, getting into different types of microscopy. Well, we don't need to beat this over the, we don't need to beat a dead horse. Really, there are just many types of microscopy. Certain specimens are appropriate for light and they typically require staining, which you'll have many lab activities to go into this process. So preparing stains, well, preparing smears, I should say. Staining is just a term that's used for color, coloring microorganisms with a certain dye, which helps distinguish or emphasize certain structures, whether you want to look at maybe the nucleus of a cell or maybe the mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, different parts of a cell, maybe the flagellum or cilia, the external structures. A smear is simply a thin film of material containing microorganisms spread over a slide. And then microorganisms, well, they are fixed for a very specific reason. And the reason is to help attach it to the slide, which kills the microorganisms. Preparing smears for staining. Well, Typically, live or unstained specimens have very little contrast with the surrounding medium. Basically, what they're already present on. You're not going to typically be able to tell apart one part of the specimen from another or from what the medium actually is that's located in. Live specimens, well, they're needed for, distinct, for observing the actual behavior of that specimen. Stains can involve sometimes a positive or negative ion, which is typically a colored molecule. It could be a chromophore. In a basic dye, the chromophore is going to be a positive cation, or it's an ion that has a positive charge. And for acidic dye, the coloring agent is going to be a negative ion, which is called an anion. Staining background. Instead of the cell, well, that's called negative staining. So instead of directly staining your specimen, you're staining the medium that the specimen is located in. That way you can distinguish the specimen from the background as opposed to specific parts of the specimen itself. A simple stain is just a simple basic dye, nothing too big. It just helps highlight the cell and maybe certain shapes and structures on the cell. A mordant is, well, something that helps hold the stain or the coat to the specimen to enlarge it. Okay. Differential stains. Well, they can be a gram stain or an acid fast stain. It helps classify bacteria into a gram-positive or gram-negative stain if you perform a gram stain. Oh. What I mean to say is there are two types of bacteria, which are gram-positive or gram-negative, and performing a gram stain helps you know what type of bacteria it is. Essentially, gram-positive bacteria, they have very thick cell walls, very thick protein-carbohydrate cell walls, whereas gram-negative bacteria have very thin peptidoglycan cell walls, and usually a layer of lipopolysaccharides, or a layer that has sugars, carbohydrates, as well as fats, lipids. So, gram-positive, their cell walls are very thick with peptidoglycans, or protein carbs, and gram-negative bacteria, they have a thinner cell wall. Knowing the difference between a, being able to tell if you have a gram positive or gram negative cell, oftentimes can help you determine what type of infectious agent you're working with. 
or what kind of medicine is needed to actually hamper that cell. And well, here's basically the basic steps for staining, for performing a stain. You should remember the, these specific steps. Step one is really applying crystal violet, which is a purple dye. And then the next thing, the next step is applying iodine, which acts as the mordant. The next step is that you would perform an alcohol wash, which helps decolorize. And then last would be the application of safranin, which is a counter stain. And essentially at the end of it, gram positive bacteria would appear as one particular color and gram negative bacteria would, perf would show up as one other color. So basic steps, add crystal violet, then iodine, then alcohol, then safranin. So C-I-A-S, C-I-A-S. And that's just an example of gram staining. Acid fast stain, a different type of stain. Well, this binds bacteria or binds only to bacteria that has a waxy material in their cell walls, which is not decolorized by acid alcohol. It's used in the identification of mycobacterium, as well as nocardia. Here's an example. Let's say you have a primary stain or a carbofulsion color of an acid fast, might be red. Color of the non-acid fast stain would still be red. Then you add a decolorizing agent, such as some acid alcohol compound. Well, acid fast situation is still red. The non-acid fast is colorless. And then in the counter stain where you apply methylene blue, the color of the acid fast agent would be red, whereas the non-acid fast agent would become blue. So, boom. Now, special stains. Well, these can be used to distinguish parts of a microorganism, such as a capsule stain, endospore, or flagella. Capsules are really just the gelatinous covering that do not accept most dyes. If you want to observe them, you'll need very specific agents to actually distinguish capsules. Now, a suspension of Indian India ink or nigrosin contrasts the background with the capsule, which appears as a halo around the cell. And it basically it's an example of negative staining, where it helps it helps stain the contrast to better distinguish the medium from what your actual specimen is. Now, endospore staining involves staining the endospores, which are very resistant to, which are resistant dormant structures inside some cells that cannot be stained by ordinary methods. Typical process is using malachite green and then usually applying heat. It decolorizes the cell when you add water. The counter stain is still safranin and spores will typically appear green within red or pink cells. Flagella staining. Flagella are structures used for the movement of a cell. Uh, it uses a mordant and carbofulsion to essentially help distinguish your specimen. Well, the flagella of your specimen. And well, that concludes our chapter three lesson on microscopy. We'll get into our next lesson very shortly.